All right, good morning. Good morning. Um, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the ceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil peoples. And I'd also um, like to take a point of personal privilege before I begin my remarks and, uh, and say uh, that I understand the irony of being at the BC Federation of Labor at your 58th uh, biannual convention and having a, having a yank come and address the delegates. <laughs> I, I understand that. But um, I would like to share with you that technically I'm half Canadian because my, my mom was uh, uh, born a, a Canadian citizen and passed as a Canadian citizen. So um, I'm half Canadian, if that helps. <laughs> and then I'd also like to say, because we are uh, gathered today on, um, on the land of Indigenous uh, peoples, I want to greet you all with a traditional Indigenous uh, welcome, which is, or reassurance, which is, I come with a good heart and I come with a good mind. So let's say, so I, um, I was asked to come here and talk about Janice, and as Aaron indicated, like what is the IBEW in the States, what are they doing around this? And for two reasons, I think, that the Federation asked me to be here. And one is to understand the mechanics of Janice and the impacts and, and what's really going on, because unfortunately, the United States is not just exporting goods and services to, uh, to your country, but we're exporting policy and even judicial precedent, unfortunately. My grave apologies for that. But the other and the, probably the most important reason um, and which is I'm like incredibly excited to be here, is that the solution is within reach. The solution for Janice in the States is within reach, and the solution to anything that ails the labor movement, uh, regardless of, of whether we're talking about the Federation or its affiliates or local unions or internationals, the, the remedy is, is clearly within reach. And all we have to do is go back in history to understand what the solution is, and that's what we've been drawing on in the States, and I'm really excited to be sharing that with you. So let's. So let's take a moment, let's talk a little bit. I know Aaron unpacked Janice a little bit, right? It's, Jas it's uh, Janice versus ASME. It overturned over 41 years of legal precedent in the states, because 41 years ago there was a US Supreme Court decision that said union security uh, clauses in, in collectively bargained agreements are completely constitutional. So it overturned that. And, and Aaron is correct. It impacts every worker in the United States but it directly impacts 7.2 million unionized, non-federal, public sector workers. And what this Supreme Court decision did was it reached into the collectively bargained agreements in every state and said, you are now right to work, right? And that's, because that's what Janus is. If you, Janus equals right to work in the United States. And there's 27 states that have right to work, which is the same thing. Right? You, uh, it's unlawful to have that union security language. But it, under federal law in the states and under state law in the states, um, it's illegal for, like, for us to compel either membership dues or fair share fees. Um, so workers who are covered by a collectively bargained agreement can opt out of membership, but yet they still retain all the benefits that exist in that collectively bargained agreement. And under law, the local union, and their uh, representatives and the stewards, by law, must represent those non-members to the same zeal and efficacy that they do 40-year uh, members. Yeah. So you can, you can understand where this is going, right? And so, you know, if you think for a minute, you know, what do you think this means for our local unions and our internationals and our national unions in the states going forward? So the California State Fed predicted prior to the Janus decision on June 27th that um, roughly 30% of union members, if Janus, like after Janus, because we, we pretty much knew what the decision was going to be. It's an 83-page decision that is the most incredible legal mental gymnastics reverse engineered uh, piece of legal work that you could ever see. We knew that, it was gonna, that the outcome was going to be what it was. Um, so we were going into it thinking, like, what are, what are the impacts? Well, so they predicted 30% of union members would, would likely forego their union membership and still have the coverage of the collective, collectively bargained agreement. So, you know, obviously, if you had to budget for a local union or a state fed or, or any of your, you know, your, um, uh, your home organizations and knowing going into the next uh, fiscal year that you were gonna, your revenues were going to be cut 30%, how do you budget for that? It's impossible. 
And then additionally, how would you like to go and negotiate a successor agreement, a, you know, a successor collectively bargained agreement with an employer when the employer knows that 30% of the people covered under that agreement choose not to be members? There's not only a, an opportunity for an alternative workforce, but you, know, I, you can only imagine what the concessionary bargaining position would be of that employer because they know that there is not solidarity amongst that bargaining unit. They know that people can opt out. They know that if they push really hard, they can break that local union. So you know, all of this seems very heavy and very negative. And, and my role in the IBEW's education department, I've been moving around in the states, mostly in the western states, and talking about the implications of Janus. And I get to this point, and people get really upset. They're like, this is, this is, uh, I don't think I'm going to swear from the bullshit. podium. This is bullshit, <laughs> OK? <laughs> It's absolute bullshit. I mean, in, in what world do you think that you get to have the benefits of something that is gained from the sacrifices of those who came before you for free? Right? It's bullshit. So there's, there is a solution. And this is where I want to make a bridge, is I know that Janice uh, you know, is not something that is happening in BC or, or anywhere in, in, uh, in Canada yet, hopefully not. Um, but how many of the folks in this room and all the uh, respective labor organizations that you come from and your, your, you know, your home organizations, is there, is there a entity in this room, is there a, is there a delegate or a guest in this room that is 100% satisfied with the level of membership engagement with your respective home organizations? <laughs> Anybody 100% satisfied? Anybody have too many volunteers? Anybody have too much energy and excitement? Yeah. So this is where the bridge is. This, the, the remedy, the cure to Janus, is the same cure for that lack of membership engagement, regardless of whether Janus has standing in your jurisdiction or not. Right? Because I, I just, like, think this is like, how many of you have ever, uh, have, ever heard this, uh, have ever heard any of these quotes from any of your members or any of your affiliates? Like, hey, what has my local done for me uh, lately? Right? What am, what am my dues going for anyway? I don't really understand. It seems like an awful lot of money. I'm a member because I have to be, not because I want to be. And then the next one's my personal favorite, which is my employer would give me everything in the collectively bargained agreement, even if my local union wasn't around. <laughs> right. Right. So. So the, the key to our solution, the key to the remedy, the tonic to Janus and the tonic to the lack of membership engagement, the key to that is back in our history. Right? And I, I don't know, I'm sure that the, uh, the IBEW delegates and guests that are here know this, but today the IBEW is 127 years old. Today, November 28th, today. So 127 years ago, in 1891 today, 10 founders of then the National Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, because the first Canadian local doesn't join until 1899, yay, right? And 10 workers gather in a dance hall, Stoley's Dance Hall in St. Louis, Missouri, and they create a vision for, not, for a, at the time, a National Electrical Workers Union. And I know that not everybody in here is, is you know, electrical workers, and, and I love that, right? This is the BC Federation. But I'm going to speak and use the IBEW's history as to illustrate what is likely similar in your home organization's history as well. So this is the one I know, so I'm going to use this one to illustrate what is likely consistent with the history and structure of, of your home organizations, right? So 127 years ago, 10 workers gather in the Stoley's Dance Hall. They represent 286 workers across the United States. And they put a plan together that is, you know, with 286 workers in eight cities in the United States, these workers did not have any power, had very, very little power. And they wanted workers to have more power. They wanted workers to have more voice. So they formulated this plan of creating a national organization, and it's pretty simple. It's workers talking to workers about what can happen if we band together. Right? So what did they talk about? Right? 
Did they talk about paid time off? Did they talk about vacations? Did they talk about pensions? Did they talk about health insurance and bumping rights and seniority and grievances and arbitrations and negotiations? These are all incredibly important things. But when workers have no power, is this what they're talking about? So what were they talking about? What were they talking about? They were talking about hope. They were talking about opportunity. They were talking about dignity. They were talking about respect and equity and security and hope and social justice. Because these are the things that are necessary in order for workers to build power, they must build coalitions. And in order to build coalitions to build that power and to build that voice and to build opportunity and to build hope, they have to use human values, values that resonate with all human beings, all workers. And let me just, let me just elaborate, let me just illustrate this by saying, like, I have up here the latest uh, IBEW's constitution. Every organization in this room has, a parent, has an organization, including the BC Fed. And these words that I'm going to read from, for you are come from the declaration of the IBEW, or I should say the declaration of the NBEW, because these very words I'm going to read to you, next slide please, uh, they come from those 10 workers that gathered 127 years ago today. So the declaration of the IBEW, I, I like to call it the mission statement, and it reads as follows. Our cause is the cause of human justice, human rights, human security. It goes, to, yeah. It goes on to say that we refuse and will always refuse to condone or tolerate dictatorship or oppression of any kind. These are the words that were used to build this power. So I'm going to go on and I'm going to read. There's, ten, there's 11 objects or goals that these 10 workers 127 years ago today in St. Louis, Missouri put pen to paper and said, this is what we're going to try to accomplish. And the, there's 11 of them. And the very first object says to organize all electrical workers in the United States and Canada, including those in public utilities and electrical manufacturing, into local unions. It goes on to say to promote reasonable methods of work, to assist each other in sickness and distress, to secure employment, to reduce the hours of daily work, to secure adequate pay for our work, to seek a higher and higher standard of living, to seek security for the individual, and then the 11th object, which is my personal favorite, says, and by all legal and proper means, to elevate the moral, intellectual, and social conditions of our members, their families, and dependents, and the interests of a higher standard of citizenship. So the question is, did this plan work? The power of big ideas, hope, opportunity, dignity, respect, equity, fairness, justice, social justice, did it work? Well, I'm pleased to tell you that in an IBEW local, Local 483, which was chartered in 1906, 1906 in Pierce County, which is where I lived, Tacoma, Washington, in two years, by 1908, they had increased their membership by 260%. The vast majority of their membership worked at what was then called Tacoma City Light, which is now Tacoma Public Utilities. They had 80% union density at Tacoma City Light two years after they were chartered. So that 1908 increased their membership by 260%. They had 80% voluntary union membership. What year did they get their first collectively bargained agreement between 483 and Tacoma City Light? 1946. There's no collectively bargained agreement in place and this local represents outside line workers. Other outside line workers that didn't work for Tacoma City Light voluntarily joined Local 483. And most of those, the employers they worked with, they didn't get a collectively bargained agreement until the 50s. So these folks that voluntarily joined this IBEW did it because of the power of the big ideas, hope, opportunity, dignity, and respect, and, and one universally held truth which is every human being wants the lives of their children to be better than their own, regardless of geopolitical borders, regardless of anything else, right? That's what these workers were hoping for. 
And, and, and many of these uh, IBEW members, Local 43 and Local 77, and, uh, has the same history. They were chartered in 1897. And they came out of Spokane, Washington. And most of their members work for an entity called Washington Water Power, which is now a Vista Corporation, an investor-owned utility. Right? They didn't get their, so they start in 1897. They don't get their first collectively bargained agreement until 1941. So generations of workers voluntarily become members of the IBEW in the absence of a collectively bargained agreement because they believe in the power of these big ideas. Interestingly enough, this right to work attack that's, happened, that's come in its latest form in the form of Janus in the States, so it's not new to us. In 1947, the United States Congress amends the National Labor Relations Act that says, hey states, you can uh, adopt right to work on the state level via various legislative political uh, you know, initiative processes, right, political processes. And there's now 27 states in the U.S. that have this, you know, union security clauses are unconstitutional, right, right to work. And 18 of those 27 states adopted that right to work policy from 1947 to 1960. And just given that bit of information, what do you think happened to union density, or the percentage of union workers in the states from 1947 to 1960? Did it go up and down or did it stay the same? It went up. It actually goes up. Why? Because I think workers were talking about hope and opportunity and dignity and respect and the power of these big ideas. Right? Further metrics of how of the power of this message, the IBEW in 1973 uh, reaches a million members. And I come from the construction side of the IBEW. I'm, I'm a journey level electrician. And, and I recognize not everybody in the room uh, is either building trades or fr from the trades, but I, and I, I don't want to alienate anybody, but this next statistic is an incredible measure of the success of this plan of workers talking to workers about human values. Because in the IBEW in 1947 had 93% market share in the United States. So what does that mean? That means that 93% of all electrical construction work performed in the United States was performed by who? Union IBEW members. And in the building trades as a whole, 85%. 85% of all construction work performed in the United States was performed by union members. And here's the thing that's super interesting, is if you take a look at the collectively bargained agreements that were in place, like when all of this was happening, they look nothing like the agreements that you have. So imagine, like, imagine your master agreements, imagine the collectively bargained agreements you have in your home organizations. How many pages are they? Are they longer than three? Right? So uh, I, I have a, a slide that indicates that I know that you probably can't uh, see this super well, but this is a rendition of a collectively bargained agreement between an IBEW local in Bakersfield, California, Local 428, which still exists today, and the National Electrical Contractors Association. It is dated the 10th of May, 1934. 34, huh. So this is 13 years, but, and this is a construction agreement. This is 13 years before the IBEW has 93% market share in the United States. 13 years. Right. It's this first page, it's the second page that you have up on the screen, and a signature page. That's it. That's it. And the only working conditions that are contained in this collectively bargained agreement are as follows. Hours shall be six hours per day, five days a week, which sounds pretty good. Work starts at 9 a.m., finishes at 4 p.m. The rate of pay shall be a minimum of $1.25 a day. Yeah. So the reason that I share this with you is sometimes we get so hung up on, because we have really terrific collectively bargained agreements that are the result of successor agreements and building that bargaining relationship over time, and we rely on those right, as, a, as our olive branch to unrepresentative workers, future members. When in fact, I would like to argue that what we should be doing is going back to that plan that grew the labor movement in the States and likely in Canada, but certainly in the IBEW, to go from industry insignificance to industry dominance. The inter other interesting thing is, so from 1891 to 1947, 
right? The construction branch of the IBW goes from you know, controlling as much work as 286 workers in eight cities can control to 93% control of the electrical construction industry. So that took 56 years. 44 of those 56 years, there was no federal law, there was no state law, there was no any law that gave workers the protection or the right to form and join unions or assist labor organization to band together for concerted activity and for mutual aid and protection. That didn't exist. So these workers built this movement with nothing more than the power of the big idea. The lives of your children could be better than your own. Hope, opportunity, dignity, and respect. So what happened? Well, unfortunately, right, we lost sight of that vision. And for generations, at least I can speak for the IBW, for generations, we, we shifted our plan once we, uh, once we achieved a, a certain amount of, uh, of dominance and uh, power and voice, and we moved away from empowering workers with those same human values. So how do we get it back? What's the solution? We go back to that original plan, right? Workers talking to workers, using values, those human values to frame our discussions, and sharing our union stories with anyone and everyone that's willing to hear it. And, and I'll, I'll come back to this uh, union stories in a minute. And, and here's this, I, I, in the education department, I've, 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 I, I have the luxury of interacting with IBEW brothers and sisters day in and day out and talking to them. And uh, I like to tell people my job in the education department is building stronger communities by empowering workers through training and education. That's my job. And what I have learned is the real solution to Janice and the real solution to any weakness in the labor movement is we have to increase the percentage or the number of our members, their families, and dependents in our communities. We have to increase the percentage or number of those folks that can connect the dots between collective bargaining and who are the true beneficiaries. And so I've asked this question to likely almost thousands of IBEW members, which is, what do you like about what's in your collectively bargained agreement? What are the things that you like in your contracts, right? And think about that for a second. I do this, I've done like, I, and I ask them and I write them on a flip chart and their responses, these are not canned responses, these responses that, are, that we'll see on the screen came from workers uh, just like everybody in this room, union workers, right? And typically, their answers, the number one uh, answer has to do with wages, usually, right? Some form of wages. Yeah, no, that's cool, that's cool, bring them up. Wages, benefits, working conditions, pensions, health insurance, safety, grievance, just cause, seniority, uh, shift differentials, you know, vacation, paid time off, all of this stuff that's in your collectively bargained agreement. That's good. We like these things. The next question is, why? Why are these the things that are important to you? Why? And the answer that I get overwhelmingly is family. The answer that I get overwhelmingly is family, security, opportunity, dignity, respect, voice. I have you show them. These are not, I didn't make these up. These answers are the result of uh, flip chart work at local, union, at local unions, and these are the responses that I've gotten, honestly, from IBEW members across various states. And then the one that I love the best is lock in my dreams. You see that up there? I, that came from an IBEW member. I, this, having this collectively bargained agreement allows me to lock in my dreams. Do you not see in these responses the same human values that were written 127 years ago by 10 founders of the National Brotherhood of Electrical Workers? Are they not the same? So the point is that these human values are as just as relevant today as they were 127 years ago. Even though we are sitting in a hall today when we just had the credentials report that there's over a thousand delegates here at the BC Federation 58th convention. It's not 10 founders in a Stoli's dance hall in St. Louis. So we are starting from a position of significantly uh, uh, increased strength than we were 127 years ago. 
But this is the secret to, this is the cure. This is the cure to Janice. This is the cure to membership uh, anemia. This is the cure to everything that ails us, is going back to that plan of workers talking to workers about these human values that are resonating today just as strong as they did 127 years ago, right? So how do we have these conversations? How do we start these conversations? Well, we start by asking some open-ended questions. And this is what the work that we've been doing uh, down in the western states, in Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, Hawaii. Don't get jealous, they never send me there, which is where I do my work. <laughs> so if you want to open up a conversation, is you ask open-ended questions, right? So the first, if you could change one thing about your workplace, what would it be? The reason I love this is because I was doing a training one time and a sister came up to me and she said, Tracy, you're telling me you want me to go back into the workplace and talk about our union. As soon as I mention the word union, people don't want to talk to me. So what's the answer? Don't say, don't use the word union. Right? If you could change one thing about your workplace, what would it be? It's the same question as, what do you like about your contract? But it doesn't have that union political stuff on it, right? Because they're going to tell you if, you, like, if you change one thing about your workplace, it's something that they want that they don't have in their workplace. And why do they want it? Because they want it to help their family. They want it for security for their family. They want, they want voice, they want opportunity, they want those human values, right? And then some additional questions that we've been using in the States really about um, this Janus thing is, you know, what do you like about your contract, which you already covered, right? What do you think might happen if, uh, if we no longer had a strong local union? So starting these conversations about the prospect of what could happen with Janus. Why do you like working here? And what are some things you remember about our last negotiations? So some locals in this work, they're actually making, making doppelganger agreements. So, I mean, many of you in this room have likely negotiated, sat across from an employer and negotiated a collectively bargained agreement. And you can imagine in your mind some of the horrific management proposals they slid across the table at you. Well, what they're doing is they're putting uh, together doppelganger agreements that reflect management's proposals and they're sharing them with their members and saying, if the local wasn't around, not only would you likely not have a collectively bargained agreement, oh, but it would likely look something like this. Does that make sense? It's very powerful. And the real goal here is to find some common ground. Right? Try not to make assumptions. These are the best practices that we're talking about in the States around Janus and building our local unions. Try not to make assumptions, asking open-ended questions, listening to understand rather than listening to respond, and using value-based statements to create gracious space. Right? So human beings very rarely like to be wrong. One of their, human beings generally, their least favorite words to say are, you're right and I'm wrong. But if we can create some gracious space that allow folks to say, well, you know what? Nobody's ever kind of explained it to me quite like that before. I didn't know that. I didn't, I, I didn't understand that. Then folks can arrive at a different conclusion, preserving their ego. And, and when they arrive at that new conclusion, they can say, you know what? I wasn't wrong before. It's just this position is better informed. Right? So it's really important. Words have a tremendous amount of power. So it's really important that these values of hope and opportunity and dignity and respect and equity and fairness and justice are reflected in our conversations. So I don't talk about pensions. I talk about retirement with security and dignity. I don't talk about union rights. I talk about workers' rights. I don't, uh, and if I could change one thing in the labor movement, I would outlaw using the union instead of our union, my union, your union. Because I don't know exactly what the union is, but I sure shit know what my union, your union, <laughs> our union is. And then uh, the last one is, you know, there's been a lot of conversation in the States about minimum wage. I don't want to call it minimum wage. I want to call it, you know, family wages, living wages. So that you feel the difference between these statements and the way that words get, you know, ideas get framed. So the, the next thing I want to uh, just cover, and I know that I'm up against a little bit of time, so, but I'm super stoked about this, is three minutes, okay, sharing. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't get to say okay. that. Is sharing our union stories. 
Right? And I call this, since I come from the IBEW, I call this, like, in my trainings, I say, like, you need to share your IBEW ET heart light story, which I know is a little corny, but you guys remember e the movie ET? And when ET was happy, like his chest glowed red, is um, what is it that happened in your past? What is it that allowed you or inspired you to become active in your union, to, be, uh, to, to uh, recruit others, to motivate you to be active, to be supportive, and to help build your union, our union? And one of the things that we have done in this Janus training and building up to this is asking workers to share in the introductions, the very beginning, share one tangible or measurable instance where being a union member has had a positive impact on you your life and the lives of your family. And some of the stories are so incredibly powerful. I had a, a brother in Clark Fork, Idaho say his wife was diagnosed with cancer and had he not had the health insurance that was in his collectively bargained agreement, likely his wife would have died and he would be bankrupt from a medical bankruptcy. He owes everything he has, including the life of his wife to the IBW. It was in Los Angeles, California, and there was a, a, a woman that's a, a hydro operator, and she's up on the stage and she's saying, I'm a single mother, and I'm a hydro operator for Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. My daughter is going to medical school, and my daughter is going to medical school because I'm a hydro operator at the LA Department of Water and Power. Everything, and for me, I have, a, I have a number of, uh, of stories about what inspired me to become active in the IBEW. And one of the, I've, I'm fortunate enough to have many. And one of them is, it's interesting, is I came from a very anti-union family. And not just, you know, uh, neutral, but anti-union. And when I started my journey in the IBEW, my family was uh, not pleased at all. In fact, my sister said when I told her what I was going to do, she said to me, I cannot support that decision. Yeah, that's a quote. So fast forward, my mom gets very sick, and, um, and I have a pretty small family. So my, at the time, it's my mom and my dad, and I have an older brother and I have an older sister. And my older brother and older sister, at the time, they, they were kind of big shots in the t corporate world. My mom gets very sick, she has cancer. We're down and, uh, and we were down in Arizona, which is not where we live, right? My parents were down there enjoying the sun. And everybody's wringing their hands because my brother and sister are the big shots in the management world. They gotta go back to work, but my family needs help. So I call my boss in DC and I explain the situation and guess who got to spend the most time, guess who got to take care of their mom when she was dying from cancer? Was it my older brother, my older sister, or was it me, the union member? was me. And when I tell that story, usually people ask, somebody will ask me, because it's usually a smaller room than what's in here today. <laughs> like, they'll ask me, like, Are you, what does your family think about uh, you being a union member? And so it comes back to the power of this hope and opportunity and security and dignity and respect. My family doesn't talk smack about unions anymore at all because they also saw the values of our organization, the IBW and your organizations, and they were the direct beneficiaries of it and the ability to be able to take care of my mom and take care of my family. And that overturned even my father, who for his entire life, his father told him how the unions were bad. So from the person that he's closest to, or one of the people he's closest to on the face of the planet, this one action of seeing our values overturns all of that anti-union propaganda in a single action. So update real quick. So some locals in, uh, you, you know, in the West Coast, they've been doing some really good work in terms, and using these best practices. Local 1245, which is a 20,000 member local in California, they have 2,500 public sector members that were directly impacted by Janus. And I can report to you as of last week, because of this work and communicating the values, they have less than 1% of their members that could drop membership have dropped. Less than one. It's actually like something like 0.17%. 
Local 77, which is an 8,300 member local, 3,800 members are public sector impacted by Janus, also exceeds 99% union, voluntary union density. And then there's a local in New Jersey, because I was to say, hey, it's not just the West Coast. There's a local in New Jersey, local 1158, and their union density post Janus is not only uh, at 100%, but they are on the very verge of adding 100 more members to their, to their roles. <laughs> and local 483, since I told you about them earlier tonight, uh, they are at uh, just under 99% voluntary membership, 98.63. So this is the proof of the work. And, uh, I, and there's so much more I want to share with you, but I know that uh, we're close to, I'm probably over time, and so very quickly, is most of these campaigns at 1245 and 77 and 1158 and 483, they started with one person. They started with one person that built that, and then it you know, ripples out. And so I want to leave you this morning with a, one of my favorite quotes from Robert F. Kennedy. And it goes, few will have the greatness to bend history itself but each of us can work to change a small portion of events. And in the total of these acts will be written the history of this generation. It is from numberless and diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or strikes out against injustice or acts to improve the lot of others, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. So again, thank you very much, sisters and brothers. Thank you to the officers of the Federation. Thank you uh, to the delegates. Uh, and I just want to say it's an, it's an incredible honor to be with you this morning and want to leave you with is let's us all join together, United States and Canada, and let's, now, let's write now the history of this generation of the labor movement. Are you with me?